Entrepreneurially Thinking is a presentation of BioSTL and CET, Center for Emerging Technologies, with Rare Gem Productions, changing the way you view new ventures, including you on the pathway to success with your business in the St. Louis marketplace and beyond. Here's your hosts, Cheryl and Christy. Now let's get thinking entrepreneurially. Welcome to the Entrepreneurially Thinking Podcast. Our goal is to energize your entrepreneurial mindset and create pathways for business success in St. Louis Marketplace and beyond. I'm Christy Maxfield. I am the Director of Entrepreneur Development Services at the Center for Emerging Technologies. And I'm Dr. Cheryl Watkins-Moore, Director of Bioscience and Entrepreneurial Inclusion for BioSTL. With each new show, we are stepping out of our comfort zone. We hope that you'll come join us for the journey and start to take the constraints off of how you view your current and future endeavors. You can stay in touch and join us on a regular basis at the entrepreneuriallythinking.com website, as well as on your favorite streaming platforms, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or by using the hashtag EthinkSTL. Yes, and today we are so happy to be talking with Steve Epner. He is the founder of The Startup Within, an organization that assists existing companies in finding entrepreneurial paths. Steve is also a mentor with, uh, and has been a mentor with uh, organizations here in the St. Louis market. He's a St. Louis University faculty member teaching entrepreneurship to those in corporate environments and was a Boeing employee playing a key role within the Boeing Ventures organization, which was charged with developing or finding new products for new markets. This is a special discussion for all of you corporate folks looking for new, different, and innovative ways to move your organization forward. We'll be speaking with Steve about his experience with corporate innovation teams and how he supported many of these teams to find entrepreneurial paths. You don't want to miss this discussion. I also want to highlight that Steve is an author. Yes, he is. He has a book um, that's entitled Simplify Everything. And I love this subtitle. Get your team from doo-doo to dun-dun with one surefire process. That's fantastic. <laughs> and our listeners will be able to access an ebook version of this thanks to Steve's generosity. So we're really excited to have that conversation when we get back. Yes. Now here's Make It Happen with Keith Sales Pro. What do the most successful people do every day before 8 a.m.? Well, rise and shine. Love it or hate it, utilizing the morning hours before work may be the key to a successful and healthy lifestyle. That's right. Early rising is a common trait found in many CEOs, government officials, and other influential people. Margaret Thatcher was up every day at 5 a.m. And Robert Iger, the CEO of Disney since 2000, wakes up at 4.30 a.m. every morning. Here are five other things you must do. Number one, exercise every morning at least 30 minutes a day. Number two, map out your day. Set your goals and priorities for the day. Number three, eat a healthy breakfast and all meals when possible. Number four, visualize the day, meditation, prayer, or quiet time. Number five, make your day top heavy. Put most of your workload at the beginning of your day when you're the freshest. Today, remember, it can happen. It will happen. And together, we will make it happen. Follow Keith Sales Pro on Facebook or Twitter at Keith Sales Pro. Or visit his website at KeithSalesPro.com. It can happen. It will happen. And together, we will make it happen. How you doing? I'm Keith Turner with Turn Group Technologies, and thinking entrepreneurially means solving problems for clients, plain and simple. So, Steve, you've had a very interesting career path. Could you walk us through a little bit of how you got to where you are today and and what's inspired you to work with entrepreneurs? Wow, that's quite a question. So... Uh, we got to go way back. Uh, I think I started my first company when I was around eight years old. Wow. Uh, Are you kidding me? No. Eight years old. Wow. My, my parents were flabbergasted. Um, this will give away my age a little bit, but we had comic books then, and in the comic books you could sign up for these little businesses. And I signed up for a company that allowed me to sell pencils and things with people's name on it. Oh, cool. So I took this and in July started canvassing the neighborhood, selling things for the next school year. And my parents could not believe how much money I generated in sales. People would give me money, make the orders, and then in August when I got all the printed materials back, 
I went door to door, handed it all out. That was very cool. Yeah, that was very cool. And I love the pre-order model. I know. (laughs) I know. And and it's such a great, because we're we're both dating ourselves, but this is when people had to go out and go, you know, school shopping. There were no Walmarts. There were no, you know, easy access places to go get all these things done. So you were their easy access. And personalized. Yes. And this is way before internet. This was way before internet. In any case, you know, then as I progressed, I actually got real jobs. I I remember when when I turned 16 and could get my first real job, I went to work for McDonald's, Mm -hmm. uh, flipping hamburgers. And we made our own french fries back then. You actually had to take raw potatoes, clean them, cut them, and fry them. Oh, wow. And and a bag of french fries cost 10 cents. (laughs) So inventory management, <laughs> right. I'm seeing yeah. themes. All, all, of those, all of those kinds of things. And then working through college uh, at Union Carbide and then uh, graduating. I came here to St. Louis with Monsanto uh, in 1970. Uh, then spent uh, almost five years with Monsanto, a couple years with Citicorp. And then decided, you know what, if I'm going to work this hard, for somebody else, why not do it for me? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think we've all had that yep. thought at one point or another. Right. I think that's why many entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. Well, <laughs> it's making that transition. Right. Well, that's right. And, and I just got to the point where I was somewhat frustrated with large corporate lifestyles. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, the first thing I asked is, what's the worst that can happen? Right. Well, the absolute worst thing that would happen is I'd have to take a real job again. And I like to tell people I haven't worked since. So, so that was simple. And I also made the decision at that point that I didn't want to work for a large company. And I considered a large company any group of two or more people. That's so, a very clear definition. Right. Very clear. So I started out on my own. And this is something that I would recommend to mm-hmm. all people who are thinking about entrepreneurs. If you have a skill, and my skill back then was programming. Mm. If you have a skill and you become what I call a doer, a capital D, and you do whatever that skill is well, people will recognize it and your name will be passed from person to person and you will start to build a business. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you need to hire people and you have no clue what to do. So the first thing you do is hire a clone, somebody who looks as close to you as you can get because you want them to do with you. Mm -hmm. And so you get going and you're doing more and more business and suddenly you recognize that there's a problem here. A whole bunch of D's, doers, can't succeed. What you need to do is you need to have a manager. You need to have somebody who gets things done through other people. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of a lot of times people do hire themselves uh, when they start a new business, and I've always heard that's sometimes not the best thing to do. Uh, you need an opposite, or you need somebody who can really, uh, while you're focused on growing the business and building the business, someone to manage. Well, and complement your skill set. Yes. Often yes. we tell folks, you know, not only know what you do and do well, but also know what you don't like to do mm-hmm. and uh, what you don't do well. And even if you do it really well, if you don't like doing it, you probably need to bring somebody else on the right. team. Well, That's... one of my sayings is do what you do best mm-hmm. and outsource the rest. Yes. Sounds good. Yes. I didn't like accounting. <laughs> I still think it's a black science. <laughs> I am glad to pay whatever it costs to get somebody else to take care of that right. for me. It's understanding your gaps, like you said, and, and, and filling those gaps in, in your organization. And it means that there is space in an entrepreneurial venue for folks who consider themselves fairly traditional and not necessarily entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. That accountant, you need them. They're really good at doing that. They could do it for a really big corporation or they could do it for you, your company. Either way, they're staying in their lane and doing their thing, Absolutely. but part of the entrepreneurial experience when and, they're working for you. And it's the exact same thing that I did. So you find a capital D, a doer, who's an accountant. They do a good job. Their name gets passed around from small mm-hmm. company to small company. Pretty soon, they need to hire somebody, mm-hmm. so they hire another accountant. Mm-hmm. And pretty soon, they get three or four of them, and they realize, I need a manager. And I'll tell you, in my case, I couldn't manage my way out of a paper bag. <laughs> okay. It's just not who I am. Uh, you know, 
as a doer and I think as a leader, I had a vision for where I could go. And I wanted to sell that vision, and I wanted people to buy into it, to really mm-hmm. like it. But a manager is somebody who kicks butt and takes names. Right. Absolutely. And so most people who lead businesses are not good managers. Right. And I think what you talk about is very interesting because by, you know, finding – people to fill the skill gap that you have, not only in your organization, but other organizations. That's how our entrepreneurial ecosystem grows, Um, because these folks are filling gaps um, where um, not only where new businesses have those gaps, but existing larger businesses might have those gaps, too. So it's it's also great for someone who's considering, well, you know, I only know about you know, marketing or accounting, where those functional roles are needed, are, are very much needed um, in order for people to move forward. So as we are are talking today about um, your impact in, in your business, I think uh, what's really interesting is talk to us about those entrepreneurs that are sitting in corporate settings. How do you interact with those folks? Because your your organization works with entrepreneurs in those particular settings. Correct. So the, the first thing we need to understand is why entrepreneurs are so important to corporations. So one of the examples I like to use, and most people today do not remember the company called VisiCalc. No, I don't even think I ever heard of it. So VisiCalc was the company that invented the spreadsheet. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, well, here's what's interesting. Not only did they invent the spreadsheet, but they had 100% of the spreadsheet marketplace. And then they sat back on their back end, and another little company called Lotus Mm -hmm. came along and took over the top spot. They kicked VisiCalc out, and VisiCalc actually is out of business. They were bought. Then Lotus felt, well, now we're king of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And they didn't innovate fast enough, and along came Excel. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we try to tell corporate America is just because you have a good idea doesn't mean you can ride it forever. Mm -hmm. Things are changing out there. So you want to encourage people within the organization to innovate and to be entrepreneurial. When things are going good, though, that can be really hard. Well, it can also be very hard because people are often afraid that they are going to cannibalize their business. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the best example of that is Kodak. Right. Okay. Kodak was terrified by digital cameras, they thought it would ruin the film business. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to do digital cameras. Mm -hmm. And yet, do you know who invented the digital camera? Kodak. Kodak. The only reason Kodak still is in business at all, because of their patents. Anybody who makes a digital camera today Mm -hmm. has to pay Kodak a royalty. Mm -hmm. Now, Think about what would have occurred if Kodak, instead of wanting to protect the film paper business, had actually gone into the digital business. They would own photography today. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're out of business. That's a famous business school case. I mean, when you look at the whole Kodak market, and it is very intriguing because they would not exist had they not had these patents. And I think there are some companies, uh, uh, you know, especially on the pharma side, they're being forced because even though they have patent protection, they're being forced to look at how do they innovate their products because quickly, you know, with the generic markets and the longevity, which is not really long when you're talking about drug development and patent protection, how they need to, to innovate and, and continually innovate because the market is moving so quickly. Oh, yeah. And even, even things as simple as pet food. Mm-hmm. I mean, here in town, we have Nestle Purina. Yes. Who is a shining star, an example of what can be done. And they have a new dog food out. I think it's called Bright Minds. Hmm. And they have found there is a chemical in coconut that helps rejuvenate brains. Wow. And, and it works. In, it's been proven to work in animals, and they're now proving it in humans. And they have pictures. If you watch the commercials of a dog who's sort of listless and doesn't want to play, and 30 days of being on this diet, all of a sudden, the dog is like 10 years younger. Mm. And 
this is just pure innovation. And people will think, well, how can you innovate with kibble? I mean, right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kibble. a basic dog food, and, and they're innovating every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at Anheuser-Busch. What, what great stories of innovation they've had. I mean, if anybody's had one of their burritas, mm-hmm. you know, a lime burrito or something, the, the stories behind that are just amazing. It started out as a challenge to find a beer that would taste good over ice. Mm-hmm. That's a challenge. It was a challenge, and it didn't work. So they came up with a new idea. And so even old line companies with famous brands, if they're going to stay around and continue to control marketplace, and control is probably the wrong word, but lead right. marketplaces, mm-hmm. They have to be thought leaders, and to be thought leaders, you got to keep thinking. Right. right. How do you push through that fear when there's a certain level of comfort, there's a certain level of fear, um, there may even just be a feeling that we don't have that capacity within our company to keep our eye on the ball that we have in play as well as through, throw another new one in. How do you work through that? Well, there are a couple ways. One of the things, you you mentioned pharma a lot. Mm -hmm. One of the things that pharma has done is they have basically outsourced all that research. They're putting money into a dozen little companies, and they hope that one or two of them come up with super drugs that then they buy the 50% they don't own, and that becomes their next Mm -hmm. drug, Mm -hmm. which is a shame because we've given up a lot of basic research, Mm -hmm. uh, which is allowing other countries to catch up with us. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the things people are doing. The other thing, uh, there is the myth of Google where you get 20% of your time to work on whatever you want. And the reason I call that the myth is because when you work for Google, they expect you to work a minimum of 12 hours a day. Wow. So they give you two hours back to work on your own stuff. (laughs) You're still working at least two hours of overtime for them and then two hours on this. Right. But I think companies need to encourage people to think Mm -hmm. through new ideas. I have a class at St. Louis University. It's part of the MBA program. And each student is supposed to have a full-time job, and they are required through the semester to come up with a new idea that will earn their company or save their company at least what they're paying in tuition. So that's like a $50,000 per year idea, Mm -hmm. absolute minimum. We have students that bust through that every year. It is just amazing once they're given the time and a little support, because we create peer support groups in the class, they come up with amazing things. I think what's so interesting is having been a a leader at a a large global company before, I think when you talk about innovation, it's always the dual problem. You know, you have to meet P&L, and if you're doing uh, innovative type of work, sometimes that doesn't align. Well, and I've always said this: you need to take innovative teams out of that P and L piece because it doesn't work. They're not allowed to think entrepreneurially. They are held to almost the same standard of you got to make revenue in some sort of way. You've got to contribute. How do you get over that? How do you help those organizations understand? Well, understand? there's been a lot of research that has been done and interviews with many of the most successful companies in terms of innovation, and almost to 100%, not quite 100%, but almost 100%, they create a group that's responsible for the innovation, and they fund them for three to five years, Mm -hmm. and that's untouchable. They have no P&L responsibility. They've got multi-year funding so they can try things, and they have money to do experiments because that's how you learn. You have to try things. You have to be willing to go out to the marketplace, and you have to be willing to spend a couple years. Good ideas sometimes pop up overnight, but not usually. Mm -hmm. You have to have time and space. Absolutely. So how did they uh, get to the point where that kind of investment isn't the first thing on the chopping block when money gets tight? Is that something... I'm going to interrupt because it always is first thing on the chopping block. (laughs) (laughs) So when it's on the chopping block, who's making that case for why they need to continue that investment? Well... And that becomes difficult because some companies are so sure that their past success is going to be a f- repeated in the future that they don't see how bad it is. Right. So 
It's really difficult. You need to have, at the very top levels, management that is interested in the future and understands that there are places they have to go that they can't even talk about today because they don't know what they are. Right. I mean, right. think about before the Internet. Who could have envisioned the Internet? Mm-hmm. Think about before the iPod. Who could have envisioned this device taking over? I mean, we had MP3 players. It wasn't mm-hmm. new technology. But once, in this case, Apple understood that you needed a different user interface to make it simple, mm-hmm. all of a sudden it became something that everybody had to have. And it was a success. Mm-hmm. So vision, time, the investment of time, and the willingness to put money behind that time investment are and really important. And to take important. a chance. To and take a chance. I was going to say also to stay the course, because even when profits are down, you need to have somebody at that top that's a visionary to stay the course and say, no, this is where we want to focus our energies, and this is our, our opportunity for growth. And we don't always have that person at the top, but we often have the people within the organization who are eager to be entrepreneurial. So we're going to take a quick break and then talk about how we encourage those people in our organization. How can our listeners begin living their lives with focus on their physical, mental, spiritual health? What are some of those small steps that they can take? I would practice acceptance. Now, people misunderstand acceptance. They think it means I'm okay with this or it's it's fine. And acceptance is not tolerance. It is not. Acceptance means it is what it is. We used to have a saying in our office that it, it is what it is. It becomes what you make of it. So you first have to accept the facts before you can take an action. We need to thrive. Log on to AliveAndWellSTL.com. Entrepreneurship, I think, is, is, is a means of achieving your dream. And if you have a passion and you have a dream, I, I would encourage everyone to dream big and then pursue that dream with a passion. So, Steve, when we're thinking about cultivating an environment where this type of investment can happen, where there is this long-term vision and the ability to stay the course, you talked about having that leader at the top. What can the average worker do to find the place where that kind of leadership exists? Well, that is somewhat difficult because you can't tell. And especially, as you said before, when corporate profits turn, what goes on the chopping block? Mm -hmm. So you can find yourself in organizations that change philosophy. And I'm sorry, but there's nothing you can do about that. Right. So you have to either stay in the organization and hope that it'll get back to where it was, do what you can, or move on. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that sounds terrible, but that's the reality for an entrepreneur. Right. Now, the one thing that I think is really important is organizations oftentimes encourage ideas. We call that ideation. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I was uh, the entrepreneur in residence at Boeing, Mm -hmm. we had a goal of 100 new ideas every month. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's easy. When you're dealing with smart people Mm -hmm. that have insights into things that you've never even thought about, 100 ideas a month is simple. And were you cultivating those ideas from from the large body of Boeing or just from the Ventures team? No, the large body of Boeing. Yeah. So big crowdsourcing project. mm -hmm. Big crowd. But here's the problem. Not all ideas are equal Mm -hmm. and not all ideas are good. So the organization, if they're really going to succeed, needs to have a way to add a piece in there, which we call innovation. How do you take that idea and make it into a product or service that other people are willing to pay for? Mm -hmm. And one of the things at St. Louis University, Dr. Condor, instead of brainstorming, he likes to do painstorming, Mm P-A-I-N, because people will pay to make pain go away. Right. And the higher the pain, the more they're willing to pay. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Which is why I'll pay almost anything for accounting help. (laughs) Understood. (laughs) Okay. But, But the thing is, we need to take those ideas and innovate them into something that can hit the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And then after we innovate, we need to validate 
that it is an idea that can go forward. It has to align with the company, which mm-hmm. you were saying earlier. It has to be makeable, I mean, from a technological mm-hmm. standpoint. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to create a profit. That means you have to sell it for more than it costs mm-hmm. you to put it together. There has to be a market for it. So there's a list, a small list, mm-hmm. but a, a very definite list of things that can be done to validate a product. So you ideate, come up with some weird idea, innovate, create something that the market will pay for, validate that it'll work, and then accelerate it into the marketplace Mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, create that new iPod Mm -hmm. or whatever it is that you're trying to do. But around that is the glue that holds it all together, which is culture. And this is what I think you were talking about earlier, that it's so hard sometimes because the top of the organization isn't with you. If the top of the organization doesn't want to create the right culture, no matter what you do, it won't work. So you really need permission in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways to do this kind of work. Good word. Mm -hmm. Good word. You you need permission and support. But I love that Mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about these innovation teams, because I I tell you, when I was in corporate America, um, I would have loved to have been part of these corporate innovation teams. How, if if I'm sitting in an, an organization today, how do I, if the, if, if the team doesn't exist, how do I... Signal. You know, how yeah. do I signal that I'm interested? Well, there, there are a number of ways. Um, I have people come into the class every year that tell the students their stories. And because you just asked me the question, I don't have permission to put the names on the radio. Let me just tell you one story that one of the gentlemen tells. He was working for a large company and had this great idea which was really something the company had been doing years before and dropped. And he wanted to reignite the excitement over that. Mm -hmm. So he actually created a quiet team, an under-the-radar team. He let his boss know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So that That was always a good thing. (laughs) So he let his boss know what he was doing. And this group started working on this idea on their own time. They didn't use any corporate time for it. Mm. They did it off-site, and they were evolving this whole idea. And then when they were doing research, the word got out that something was going on at this company. And one of the suppliers called the CEO and said, hey, I understand you're about to get back into XYZ. And all of a sudden, everybody said, what's going on? And, <laughs> and, and they were found out. And, and so... Walter said, you know, you got to go to work ready to be fired. Mm -hmm. So he explained what he was trying to do, and they said, look, stop. We don't want you to do that right now. And Walter said, okay, uh, it's probably time for me to go find something else. Mm -hmm. But about four years later, they executed his plan. Wow. While he was there? or No, he had already left. left, Mm -hmm. But they executed the plan. They understood. So, you know, sometimes for him... You know, the the value wasn't in making a million dollars. And you have to understand that money isn't the bottom line for innovators. Mm-hmm. The fact that they did what he had laid out was all the reward he wanted. Mm. And, and if I may, I think this is an important point because lots of people think, I'm going to be an entrepreneur to make a lot of money. <laughs> Folks, that is not what drives entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. If you just want to make a lot of money, Become a trader at Wall Street. You know, if the Elster doesn't get you first, you can make a lot of money. There are quicker paths to cash (laughs) than creating something brand new from scratch. But if you have passion for something and you can be rewarded by lifestyle, you can be rewarded by the acknowledgement of what you've done. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples I use, and I I don't want to create any religious conversations here, but look at Mother Teresa. Here is somebody who lived in a one-bedroom room. I mean, that was it, just a room Mm -hmm. with a bed in it. And I got to believe she was one of the happiest people that I've ever seen interviewed and talked to. She had no money, but she was doing something that she had a passion for. I think that's what a lot of entrepreneurs are. So as I talk to people about becoming entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. the first question is, do you have the passion to do this? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to have less money to have the lifestyle and the excitement of entrepreneurship? And if the answer is yes, you're a good candidate. And I think for many folks who are in corporate entities, they don't realize, but, you know, 
becoming an entrepreneur, you know a lot about your market. You know a lot about your company. Being able to develop and maybe something separate out of your organization that your organization might be interested in bringing in to their broader organization might be something that they might want to think of. And what I'm what I'm saying here, because it sounds kind of convoluted, but if you are sitting in corporate America and you understand new markets, uh, just like what you had described, someone going outside and understanding, well, how can I be innovative in that market? Starting maybe a, a young business uh, might be an opportunity for now them to come back into that corporation and be a supplier to that corporation. Oh, and I, that ha- that's happening more and more. Pharma set the example, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of companies are going outside looking for innovative ideas and new it's products. Cheaper. It, it's much cheaper. Mm-hmm. Somebody's already found the market. That, and now, remember, we talked about the stages. You're into acceleration. Mm-hmm. And now the large corporation can put their name behind it, put mm-hmm. their marketing behind it, put their sales force behind it, put the production and the supply mm-hmm. chain behind it. And all of a sudden, you can succeed rapidly mm-hmm. in that large corporation. And you under, they know you as an individual because you've worked for them. Um, I think, too, they... They have, a, I think, a better ability to trust maybe the instincts and um, what the offering that you have because you understand how that corporation works internally. So for them to bring you back as a supplier or as a consultant or, you know, something that's in- integral into their organization – into their organization sets up that entrepreneur, I think, to be even more successful. The one thing I would say, and this is critical for the entrepreneur, leave on good terms. Absolutely. Do not burn bridges. This is where you want to make sure that everybody understands what you're going to try and do. Mm-hmm. You know, you include them. You maybe include some of their supply chain people into what you're doing so they follow you. They see where it's going. There is no surprise, and you're not doing anything to harm them. That's very good advice. Well, good relationship building all along. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the bed work or the, the bedrock, I should say, <laughs> of uh, being able to have a successful company is, as you said earlier, people come to know what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And if you can build your company around that and then scale from there, you really do have a tremendous amount of opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's that equation where someone has worked for a company, left, and now is coming back in a new role as a vendor, Mm -hmm. essentially. What about those folks who I can hear them out there saying, okay, I'm one of those startup companies who's doing something really creative and innovative. Where is the big corporate entity who should be paying attention to me? Because they don't necessarily have an in with an organization, um, particularly a large corporation, and they're trying to figure out how to get their attention. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it just takes guts. Okay, just Go out and, and again, it's the old question. What's the worst thing that can happen? Mm -hmm. Write to the chairman of the board of the biggest company in town, and the worst thing that can happen is you don't get a response. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do it. Matter of fact, you know, I think one of the stories, and and there are other people you might want to interview, but if you remember Water Babies, which was a doll you filled with warm water, Mm -hmm. they're still being made. Yes. This is their 25th anniversary, believe it or not. Uh, I think they've sold $400 million worth of dolls, some crazy number. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if if you talk to the inventor Mm -hmm. of that, he will tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of letters he wrote without response or a turn down. Mm-hmm. And Dan just kept at it. Nobody would could stop him. Mm-hmm. And and Dan Lauer, I don't know if you've met him before, mm-hmm. but he was a banker. Mm-hmm. He knew nothing about dolls except that his sister liked to play with them. Right. Okay. But he had an idea. He had a passion and he went after it. And he was persistent. And he was persistent. Mm-hmm. He didn't give up. So one of the things I would say to your closet entrepreneur don't give up. Mm-hmm. The other thing, and, and you mentioned the, the book, you know, uh, simplify everything. As an entrepreneur, maybe one of the things you do is start building a reputation inside the organization by finding ways to simplify process. Mm-hmm. That can be as revenue enhancing as any new product, especially if the company's been around for more than 10 years. They have lots of things that are not done because they make money. They're done because we We've always done it that right. way. Mm-hmm. Right. Habit. Habit. And nobody remembers why we 
started doing it that mm-hmm. way. And when you look into them, you find some pretty funny things. And I don't know if we have time for an example now. So <laughs> Sure, we I'll, do. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we have plenty so, of time. So one of the examples I like to give, I was working at one organization, and one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to find some new ways to use computers. So this was a little while ago. <laughs> and and things were, you know, very manually intensive. And, and I went around, and there was one report that I was looking at that took a lot of time. It took two people about two hours every afternoon to create. And I asked, who uses this report? And nobody quite knew for sure. Hmm. All they knew is when they completed the report, they put it on the file cabinet, and by the next morning it was gone. <laughs> well, so, so I stayed Either one the night. the cleaning people took it? That was it. I stayed one night, and the cleaning crew came oh and grabbed gosh. this report. I said, what are you doing with that? They said, well, we used to leave it stack up here, but it got so heavy. So every night now we put it in this box in the closet, and once a week we take it out to the trash. Oh, my goodness. So this had been going on for oh years. Oh, my gosh. So I started doing some research. What had happened is about seven years ago, the president of the company asked for a report. He got it for about two weeks and decided... Now, it, this wasn't doing what he wanted, so he just left it on the cabinet top, but never told anybody to stop doing it. So as people left and got promoted, they taught the next person how to, to do, do this. And every afternoon, two people spent two hours creating a report that I called the closet report. And this is so interesting. There's nobody talking to each other, so that tells you a lot about what's right. not going on within these what the, within the organization. But that is truly an amazing so, story. So this. That's why I tell people, if you're doing something that takes time, that's difficult, ask. Mm -hmm. Who's using this? And do a little research. Many times you will find that nobody is. Mm -hmm. Well, when you start saving four man hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, that's worth big money to a exactly. company. Sure. That's an, and that's entrepreneurship without ever having to leave the safety of mm-hmm. a large corporation, Correct. a steady paycheck, where you don't have to sweat how payroll is going to get made that week or the week after. Right. Um, but that you also can claim that mantle of being an entrepreneur. I, I believe you can claim that mantle of being an entrepreneur. Right. Absolutely. Right. And it sets you up and creates a reputation so that now when you want to try your really crazy idea somebody say well you know you've done all these good things we'll We'll give you a chance let's see what we can do with it so if i'm given that chance if i have the opportunity to really step up and try my stuff at being um explicitly entrepreneurial let's say (laughs) what is some of the advice you would give to me to help me navigate that path well the first thing i would tell you is your first idea is never the best idea So find a peer group and try an idea on them. We call it pivoting. Mm -hmm. And ask them, if I have this idea, what is the craziest thing that I could do with this? How could I create something totally different along these lines? And people will react, and they'll tell you. Here in St. Louis, one of the things we do is our students every year have to take their ideas over to the Venture Cafe one evening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for those of you not in St. Louis, this is a weekly meeting of entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, anywhere from two to 300 people show up every week. And it's not just entrepreneurs. No. It's, it's folks from all different types of walk of life, backgrounds, industries. And there are people there who want to fund. There are mm-hmm. people with money looking to fund. There are people who are looking to build companies. Uh, Matter of fact, Boeing did a program over there because their training systems wants to do more with virtual reality. Interesting. And they wanted to find small companies who were good at virtual reality Mm -hmm. who wanted to work with Boeing. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is find peers to try your idea on Mm -hmm. and then go out and try it on the public. So talk about it, try it, iterate. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And and like I said, your first idea, it's usually the third or fourth one down the line (laughs) where you finally get to where you want to be. Where you're honing in more and more because you're getting more market research, more feedback, you're validating, doing all the things that you talked about early on. And you know what else? When you meet all of these extra people, they have new ideas, they have contacts, they can take you to the right people in the right organizations to make it go. 
So even if you're trying to do this within your existing organization, you still want to practice those good behaviors. You want to talk to people. You want to get feedback. You want to iterate. You also want to make sure that you're creating an opportunity for you to try and fail, mm -hmm. even if it's in small little ways that don't affect the P&L, let's right. say. <laughs> um, but that that allow you to really experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and if I can just add to that, don't be discouraged if your first idea doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If you read the annuals of all of the major innovators, all of the big business people, they all failed once or twice or four or five times. So a failure is not a place to stop. Matter of fact, there's a story in a large corporation of a young man who was given an opportunity to do something new, and it failed. And it cost the corporation tens of millions of dollars. Mm. And he went into his boss. And he turned in his resignation. And the boss said, I can't accept that. And the young guy said, wait a minute, I just blew this. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. I did it. And he said, look, I just spent tens of millions of dollars to get you educated. I don't want you to leave. Right. That's, That's awesome. awesome. That is awesome. That is the way of looking at building innovation within an organization. So if we want wow. to continue this conversation, mm -hmm. or I, I should say this way of thinking, mm -hmm. um, now that uh, our time together is actually coming to an end, Simplify Everything seems like a great way to do that. And that's Steve's book, again, to get from do-do to done-done <laughs> with one surefire process. And you can find that on our website. It's on your website. There is a unlocked Kindle version on your website. So people, you need to hit have a Kindle reader. If you don't have a Kindle, you can go to Amazon.com and download a free reader for any PC or even your telephone. Fantastic. So that you can read it. You need that to open the file. Okay. Great. That is key. <laughs> Understanding that you need the Kindle reader to, uh, to open up the file. Wow, this has been such a great experience, Steve. We are so happy that you came in here. And our listeners, if, if you didn't learn anything today, uh, go out there and just try. Go out there and, and, and work magic within your organization. Try new things. Um, um, this has been very valuable. Absolutely. And you can also find Steve. The Startup Within, that's all one word, dot com. And that way you can tap into his wisdom, yes. whether that's from the book, from his website, by joining us on a regular basis to hear entrepreneurially thinking. So we hope that you'll continue to be on the lookout for yes. new episodes and interesting conversations. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for joining us today. It was a real pleasure. Yes. Changing the way you view new ventures, igniting your thinking about entrepreneurship. It's Entrepreneurially Thinking. Get connected and discover more. Visit our website for show notes, resources, information about our guests, upcoming events, and of course, all your favorite episodes. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them for us in the comment sections and be sure to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes. The best way to show love is to share. Let everybody know that you're thinking entrepreneurially. So visit our website, entrepreneurallythinking.com. Hashtag EthinkSTL. Entrepreneurially Thinking is another positive production of Rare Gem Productions. Thanks for listening.